Listening to KX 93.5 Laguna's Only FM. I'm Scott Hayes, and this, of course, is Radio Caravan. And we're paying tribute uh, this morning to Hobie Alter and his influence, really, on the surf and sailing industries. Uh, we just got through playing a little Beach Boys music, which seems appropriate, I guess, to a certain level. Yeah. Our guest this morning we have here is uh, Hobie President Jeff Alter, who's Hobie's son. Yes. Yep. You're the oldest or youngest? I'm or youngest. You're the youngest yeah. son. And how many sons, how many brothers are there? How many there? sons is yet? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have an older brother and an older sister. An older brother and an older sister. Okay, yeah. And then we also have Mark Christie, who's a president of Hobie Surf Shops. I was doing some research, and there's so much really out there on, on your father. Uh, you know, surfboards, catamarans, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards. He started his business here in Laguna Beach, right? sort of building wooden surfboards out of his family's home here in Laguna Beach back in the 50s. Um, either either one of you, Jeff or Mark, I mean, just for those who may not know who Hobie was, how would you kind of describe that in a thumbnail for people who may not know? And I know that's hard to believe, you know, because he's such a, a such an iconic figure, but how would you sort of describe well, who? For me, of course, he's my father, so yeah, of that's course. pretty simple. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> But no, he was a you know he was a very good guy, innovator. Always wanted to build a better mousetrap. He just yeah. he was uh, it wasn't just about surfboards and sailboats. It was anything. I mean, he'd be looking at your office right here and redesigning something. <laughs> so really, you know, that's kind of what he was all about, pretty much. So he yeah, built, he built golf clubs and all kinds of stuff that never made it to market. But, really, but or it wasn't even intended for market. It was just kind of tinkering with things. Was he like a savant in a sense, one of those guys that just had that really interesting mind that can kind of see things and figure out a way to build it better? Was he sort of that way? I think he's probably the greatest uh, self-taught engineer I've ever seen. I mean, if you, you look at everything he's done, and it's not just the thing you talked about, skateboard trucks, different things. You know, he was an innovator uh, across the board, but he had, you know, he had a... a I think it was a 50, 40, 48 foot boat. He was, you know, taking that thing out of Dana Point Harbor and thought, you know, damn, I can build a better boat. Yeah. So we did. I mean, who does that? What, what, what was his educational background? Uh, uh, Chafee College, um, never graduated. Uh, did of, he study engineering? Does, did he just have an accent? No, kind of, but, <clears throat> it kind of sounds funny, but kind of wood shop and, and just sort of uh, learned along the way. And of course, back then, 1950, the materials he was dealing with were were somewhat new. You know, fiberglass wasn't new, but the, but the applications they were using it for, they had big heavy weave boat glass and stuff like that. And, and so, you know, people would come with new ideas, new material, that's kind of where foam showed up. And a guy came up with a little tiny block of foam and proved to him that it wouldn't soak up water. And, yeah. and uh, and polyurethane foam existed, but it was very hard to mold and very hard to control. And so he, he and Gordon Clark developed in Laguna Canyon here. A lot was done here in Laguna Beach. I mean, it's, we're just down the street from our original uh, house and, uh, and where he uh, shaped his first balsa wood boards. Yeah. And again, a guy came with a board, said, I can tell you how to build it. So as his son growing up in this environment, do you recall sort of tinkering in the garage or working with him on the surfboards? Did you gravitate toward the water early or did you sort of, what were your sort of early memories of him tinkering with stuff? Um, I, as far as early memories go, to be honest, I don't really remember that much of him tinkering with stuff other than him, you know, he worked a lot. He right. wasn't, he's not the surfer that didn't work, he's the guy that did work. And, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it was always down the street, it wasn't some distant place, he wasn't traveling, it was, it was always local. Um, so I was able to, you know, go hang out at the shop and sweep the floors or do whatever. And uh, uh, I'm also sort of a tinkerer, so maybe I got a little bit of that from him. Um, but uh, he just, uh, you know, just kind of always was doing stuff. How how were his surfing skills? Was he a was he a, was he a competent surfer? 
Yeah, he was a, he was a good surfer. He wasn't a competitive surfer, and he wasn't the, the guys that were surfing the Corky Carroll and all those guys. They were yeah. out at the beach every day. That was their life. Yeah, you know that he went to work. Right. <laughs> he built them boards <laughs> so they can surf. <laughs> you know, I think that 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 apple fell straight down from the tree. Hobie's affinity for the ocean, I mean, never never stopped. And and, and I want to kind of circle back. You talk about yeah, please tinkering. Um, you know, he had these different houses. He had one house in particular that was outside of McCall, Idaho, in, in uh, New Meadows. And it was way out in the boondocks. And here's this incredible house, you know, and you get there and you drive up and you see it. And then you get in the house, it's like, well, damn, it's like it's a one bedroom house. What's the rest of it? The rest of it was a shop. Hmm. You know, I mean, he always had a shop. Yeah. You know, when he had his place on Beach Road, there was the house, but there's the shop, you know, so it was. Uh, he was kind of a mad scientist in that way, but the, you know the difference was you know Frankenstein always came to life. Everything he pursued, it just you know he would just, as Jeff says, he would just be uh, keep after it until it worked and until it worked better than whatever the you know the existing thing was. And a lot of times there wasn't an existing thing. Right. So you know that that is an inspiration uh, certainly to these kids. I watch them leading that same kind of uh, lifestyle and and the grandkids and. And it was an inspiration to me. Yeah. You know, if you're going to do something, do what it takes to do it right. Well, you know, I have a question written down here, and that was going to be where I was leading, is, well, you know, what was one of the life lessons you would say? I know that's a complicated question in a way. I'll tell you my dad's. You know, uh, you know, set your priorities, and you know how to make your decisions. Life's a matter of decisions based upon priorities. If your priority is money, you know what decision to make. If your priority is family, you know what decision to make, right? That was sort of his one lesson. What would you say is one of the life lessons your father taught you? I, I think, generally speaking, was to be kind to everybody. Really? Seriously. I mean, he, he was a nice, he'd talk to anybody, nicest guy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about anything like that. If you, if you wanted to talk about changing this headset here, he'd spend an hour-long <laughs> conversation <laughs> talking to you about it. And, yeah. and that was, you know, it didn't matter where you came from, he was interested in that. And all the sports, the Hobie Cat racing and all that was kind of developed along those same lines where it was kind of a... It wasn't about how fat your wallet is, which is largely what sailing is. Yeah. It was about, you know, everyone that could come and compete, and whether you're a, a waste management guy or a lawyer, it didn't matter. You come together and complete, compete on a level playing field. Is that maybe, from what I read, and I, I never met your father, I never knew your father, so this is all just based on what I was able to vet online and research through the book, right? He seemed to be encircled by a lot of people that really respected him and really wanted to kind of help him succeed. Is that a fair assessment of the people that he was surrounded by? Mark? You know, you couldn't not like the guy. He, you know, here is this internationally famous uh, guy, but, but I think that the person that was least impressed with it was him. Really? You know, it was never about money. It was never about, you know, uh, accolades. In fact, you know, the moment the lights, you know, when the camera went on, he'd be, he'd, he'd leave the room. You know, he, he didn't want to be uh, patted on the back or whatever he wanted to kind of move on to the, the, the next project. But he did, you know, going back to your uh, question uh, before, you know, life lessons. I mean, he was, he was, I met, obviously, Hobie later on, Jeff met my sister, and I did love him. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he, he was a mentor to me. We were partners on some things, and, and he is the reason that I have the surf shops, and I, you know, he suggested it initially. And it's yeah. like, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, you don't, you can't know everything, you know, um, and you don't need to know everything. Just surround yourself with people who are really good at things and let them do what they do. And that's something that I've tried to live by, uh, certainly. But one thing he did say to me, which I think sort of, you know, is a metaphor for his life, uh, and this was years later, was he said, you know, if you, if you love what you do, it's never work. Mm -hmm. And if you don't love it, it'll never work. Oh, that's beautiful. So, you know, that's... I like that. I've passed that along to my son, and I'm waiting for it to kick in. And, you, know, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, but it, it is. It's a great life lesson. We handle everything from general corporate formation, partnership, real estate. We have a full-service litigation practice, and we also have a group of lawyers that handle bankruptcy and general insolvency matters. We offer big firm experience with a small firm feel. The person that you're hiring is the person who's going to be representing you throughout your entire map. The slogan of redefining full service attempts to capture two things. One, an explanation of the breadth or the diversity of the legal services that we provide. 
but also to recognize that our service to our community does not end with our legal services. Whether it's a pro bono opportunity where we're representing people for free, or whether we're actually volunteering on a project like Habitat for Humanity, for example. It includes the philanthropic efforts, the volunteering of time, and the donating of resources outside just the four corners of this law office. All right, you're listening to KEX 93.5, Laguna's only FM. I'm Scott Hayes. This, of course, is Radio Caravan. We're paying tribute this morning to Hobie Alter. We have in the studio Hobie President Jeff Alter, Hobie's uh, youngest son. And we have, of course, Mark Christie, who's um, involved in the uh, Hobie Surf Shops, president of the Hobie Surf Shops. Right, Mark? Got that right. Um, you know, your father, Jeff, your father passed away from cancer earlier this year. And first of all, I'm sorry and our condolences for that. He was uh, roughly 80 years old, do I have that right? Yes. Um, died on March 29th. Hundreds of people from around the world came to Dana Point for a paddle out memorial. I'm wondering if you, you uh, could you kind of describe that event and, and what that experience was like for you? Um, we had two events, one was at the ranch and then one was at, the, at Doheny, so um, both were uh, at kind of at different levels, um, okay. but uh, it's one of those things when it happens, especially with someone like him, you don't really know what you're going to do about it. I mean, we knew it was coming, and still we had no plan. Um, it's just something you don't want to plan for, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it just, it was amazing. I mean, I don't know how much I can talk about it, but it was no, it, the, the people that, uh, the outpouring of, of people from, I mean, people flew in from all over the world, yeah. and, and uh and it, and we didn't invite anybody. We didn't know. We weren't trying to make a public event out of it. We just figured we're going to put a date on it and hope that, you know, 100,000 people don't show up and maybe only five show up. But as it turned out, a lot showed up, and, and uh, it was somewhere in between. Um, but the paddle out, you know, as most people I've ever seen in the water, the most out-of-control paddle out. Surfers have paddle outs, and they all know exactly how you do it, and you hold hands and you go in a big ring. Well, we had sailors and surfers and golfers and all kinds of wacky people out there, power boaters and sailors, you know, and it was just basically a mob. It was really an uncontrolled yeah. paddle out. Um, Would he have loved that? No, he would okay. have been pissed. He uh, pissed. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, he would have been, we wasted everyone's time in his opinion. So, oh. <laughs> uh, you know. And we also, that same day, to, uh, we took uh, Katie Sue's a 60 foot catamaran that he built. Or I actually worked on it for three years with him. And uh, it's up in Orcas Island, uh, Washington. And there's a sister ship called the Mantis that's in Dana Point Harbor. And, and uh, mm -hmm. the owners of that were nice enough to let us use that boat. And we came out, off to Oak Street and did his ashes out here and had Beautiful. a whole parade of dolphins tip going home. So it was, it was, really? you couldn't ask for much more. I don't know how to. You know, and we again, it was kind of a non-planned event. It just happened. What, what took place out there at, at the paddle out? <laughs> I mean, once you were out there, I mean, was there any sort of service? Yeah, we did like a Hawaiian kind of service, which you also wouldn't have liked very much. But uh, um, uh, there was a group of Hawaiians that knew them and wanted to come over and you know do their the Hawaii thing, the Aloha thing, and that's the, we're not really we're more California, you know. Um, <laughs> People that think everyone the surfers are Hawaiian, but they're not. Uh, <laughs> so for us, it was a, it, you know it was really nice. They did a really nice job and kind of brought that that you know spirit of the ocean to to uh, to the event that again we didn't really know how to pull off ourselves so yeah. much. I mean, it was an indescribable day. Jeff, you know, Jeff talks about we you know we took the mantis out, we took it off of Oak Street, so we're looking at the the family's house, you know, still in the family and and where the the, the boards were built in the garage in 1950. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of a, it was a beautiful day, like a magic day, and then taking the boat up, and it was, you know, and the, and the other than me, and, and, and the list of people on the boat were kind of the who's who, but more than the who's who, they were the soul of, of California surfing, mm -hmm. literally the soul of surfing. I have chills even just thinking about it. So on the way back, you know, we're heading back, and there's no idea what to expect. As Jeff said, it's not, it's not an invite thing. It's just sort of, hey, it's going to be here. If you want to come, come. And when he says we went, we saw some dolphins, it was, it was absurd. How many, I mean, we went through a school of, of spinner dolphins and there were between 500 and 1,000 of You're, these things. Wow. And they are literally just turbining through the water following the boat. They're on all sides of us. You, I mean, it looks like you 
could have just jumped off and landed on their backs. And then this whale breaches off just off the boat and it's like okay wow, you know what Hobie yeah this is crazy you know, it's like, right. well you know what I'm, I'm not convinced yet Hobie you know show me a unicorn <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 this is a true story the next day my wife and I were sitting downtown and this girl comes walking up the street by B of A we're down by Zinc Cafe and uh She's got a unicorn head on. <laughs> wow. It's like, really? She worked for some candy shop, but just, you know. So we pull back in and we get off of Dana Point and, you know, we're expecting to see a bunch of people on the beach, at least some people, right? So we get there and it's, you know, maybe there's a hundred people or something on the beach. And we thought, we took the boat huh. from Oak Street and the plan was to come back to the paddle out with the boat. So, so um, Susan, his wife, and that, and those didn't want to paddle out, could be out on the boat. So it was kind of a, we kind of ran back into this big event. We weren't really on the beach. Right at, at Doheny, so we we took this uh, outrigger in and and got into the beach and thought, well, you know, there's a, there's a there's a good amount of people here. But then we walked back deeper into the park at Doheny and came over this ridge, and there were thousands of people. Wow, I mean, just thousands of people and thousands of vintage boards and this stage set up and all this stuff just seemed to almost happen like spontaneously and they had this beautiful presentation and then all these people like Jeff said you know probably a lot of them getting on some sort of a board or floating object for the first time it was like a grunion run going back out there but uh, you know I, I mean we'll never see anything like it again. Yeah. It sounds like you know even though he you say he might not have liked it but it, it almost seems like that collection of people was almost the perfect testament to who he was from different industries different walks of life you know different backgrounds all coming together in a you know random combination <clears throat> definitely so it was it was all walks of life and, and you know he, again he touched a lot of people in the sailing world and the surfing world and the, you know so it wasn't just a surfing thing it was it was a lot of different people emotionally on that day Jeff um, what was running through your head? I mean, this impressive turnout for... I, <laughs> the, well, and this, the event at the ranch was equally as big and, and, and a little more personal probably than, than the paddle out, mm -hmm. um, it, just because it was a little more structured. The paddle out was a little unstructured. Um, but, I, you know, it was just, it just, I guess it dawned on me that, uh, you know, how many people he truly touched and, and how much respect those people had for him. Beautiful. You know, he was inducted into the National Sailing Hall of Fame in 2011, which is affiliated with U.S. Sailing, the United States Naval Academy. I sort of looked it up online and I sort of vetted this uh, website. Other Hall of Famers that year, I want you to hear this, included uh, Dennis Conner, who won four America's Cup, and a Ted Turner, uh, who uh, made the cover of Sports Illustrated one year, uh, one month, I guess, for his sailing accomplishments. Uh, the Hall of Fame describes your father as the undisputed king of that enviable, sun-drenched subculture of Southern California, beach entrepreneurs, preneurs, excuse me, clad in Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops. Was that him? Yeah, I mean, not, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, casual dress and, you know, but <laughs> what, what, the, what they're talking about there is is that he he took sailing out of the yacht clubs and put them on the beach and turned it into a more accessible sport, which in turn helped sailing and brought more people to sailing. They might have ended up back in the yacht club, but that that was really what I think they're kind of hitting there. Was he uh, did he like being inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame, or was he sort of? I, I I think he actually did like that. Yeah. I think he was pretty proud. We were pretty proud of him, and I think he was too. I think that was a uh, uh, you know he he didn't he didn't he doesn't get a I can I don't feel he got he gets a lot of credit for a lot of what he's done, and so. What was, do you mean by that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you. No 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 no. no but that's interesting. He I, I mean I, I mean it's, it's now it's tons of credit since since his passing for sure. But um, uh -huh. but going into it, you know, even you know today's young surfer has no idea what these pioneers did to bring right. the sport to where they are today and they don't really even care which is somewhat unfortunate that's um, what you're saying, yeah uh sailors you know the same thing they look at the hobie cat as a little beach cat that you know that's just a, you know that and so those types of things so when someone like u.s sailing comes and gives him credit like that that's i think that's impressive and it's deserved well, I mean, you know, so think about it. Back in the days when he developed this Hobie Cat, it was it was yacht clubs, right? It was yeah. yacht clubs. It's it's it's, it's Caddyshack. You know, these guys. <laughs> you, you think about it, and, and all of a sudden, you know, here's this guy spoiling the whole deal, 
and he's got a boat that you can buy for a couple thousand bucks and you can keep on the beach and you can launch through the waves and they just didn't they just didn't think it was you know they didn't want any part of it that's not sailing right that's not sailing sir you know but uh and then all of a sudden you know and then the travesty of of brightly colored sails you know <laughs> oh my god yeah. what next you know so, uh, <laughs> so uh you know but i mean you know and it, and it was it was almost the same way with surfing you know by making the foam boards you could get them to the beach they were less expensive balsa was running out so he i mean he was always kind of thinking well he wasn't every man he wasn't every man he never it was never about money that I could see to him in, in any way, and he and he just wanted to have fun. And and if something made him smile, it's like, well, let's let's share this with the rest of this crowd. So, was he equally a strong business person as he was an innovator? I'll I'll take it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well. He wasn't. He was. He was nobody's fool. I mean, he knew. Right. He knew. Uh, he had just a, a, a great seat of the pants gut sense for just about anything. But he he wasn't a guy that poured over, poured over spreadsheets. I doubt he ever glanced at a spreadsheet. He was more about doing something, and circling back to what I said earlier, find people that are very good at things and let them do what they do. So. If it was, you know, surfboard manufacturing, he had people kind of running that. If it was the surf shops back in the early days, you know, he brought on uh, Dick Metz, and Dick Metz knew the value of a nickel. So, uh, you know, and and really knew how to run those shops. So, he he always sort of had, you know, if he was if he was if he was Martin, he had a Lewis, <laughs> you know, in in these different aspects, and you know, he just he he knew how to pick talent. He That's beautiful, talent. Mark. How did uh, how did he mesh with the rest of the Orange County sort of surfwear community. Uh, obviously, there's a, a lot of iconic brands that have developed right here in Orange County. And, and you know, you think of Hobie within that same category, although with surfboards and sailing a little different. But how did, how did he mesh with the other guys that were around in this era, you know, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that developed these great brands here? Well, so, I mean, you know, as, as Jeff well knows, a, a lot of the brands you know, the significant brands uh, started out mostly either in, in the trunk of somebody's car or in a garage in Laguna. Right. You know, Quicksilver was sold out of a garage. Gotcha was sold out of a garage when Billabong came here. And the funny thing is, it's still like that. All the chairmen of these various companies, you know, live within a mile of, of where we're sitting right now. But, you know, it wasn't so much that he was a competitor of theirs in terms of the product. He had these surf shops. And if you wanted to really be legit, if you wanted to have cred, you were in Hobie Surf Shop. I remember when I was a kid, I worked at Stuart Avis downtown. Stuart Avis was this men's store uh, where the Candy Baron is now. And we sold OP shorts, you know, and OP 900s, these, oh, corduroy, yeah. these corduroy shorts. I mean, that's what you wore to school. I worked at Stuart Avis and I drove to Hobie Dana Point to buy them because that's where you bought them. Right. And Dick Metz, circling back to Dick, he worked out some deal with OP, and Hobie was involved in OP you know, when it was forming, where he got the new colors you know, like two weeks before anybody else. So if you wanted to you know, have that new bright red, you know, six inch inseam short, you had to rip down to Hobie's and get it. And, and it was like that. So guys would come to them and say, hey, I got this idea. I got this idea for a brand. It's, it's Quicksilver. Can I get three feet of your rack in your stores and that and it was literally the incubator for the surfwear industry. Mark, I asked Jeff this question earlier. What did life lesson or maybe even business lesson did you learn from Hobie? Uh, there's there's just there's just too many. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, and, and and I and I you know well, yesterday was his birthday. Oh it was. Okay, know, I didn't uh, know that. Halloween. So you know, but we I, I think of him I've lost you know, a lot of people in my life, both my parents, my brother, and and, and, Ho and I think of them all the time. But there's there's so many. But I it, it, and and it relates to business. It relates to this. It relates to that. But but really, it goes back to what Jeff said earlier. Just be a good person. Yeah. Just be a good person. Jeff, uh, you know, spoke at at the service that we had at the ranch. And you go on and you Google Hobie uh, Alter on the internet, and you get a bazillion hits. <laughs> um, but he said, you know, he was looking, was there anything negative? Was there anything negative on any of these sites or whatever? And he was just one of those guys. Actually, he was like my brother, where you, you couldn't, 
nobody had a bad word to say about him. He was just a nice guy, whether you were the guy, you know, bussing the table at a restaurant or, or the chairman of some company. He treated you the same way uh, with, with equal respect, and I think, uh, you know, that pervades. You know, I, I, when I vetted him online and researched as much as I could, I noticed that. I noticed there was no negative comment, no negative publicity. It almost felt to me like it was manufactured by some great public relations machine. I know it wasn't, don't get me wrong. But I never put it together that that was just who he was. Yeah, no, there's a surreal story of um, Mike Hinson, you know, this guy that used to hang around the shop and he was one of the surfers for the original, uh, you know, Endless Summer. and. Henson, in his book, he wrote he wrote a book about his life. He he stole a bunch of surfboards from Hobie, left a <laughs> left a window open, ripped off, you know. But he but he was a much better surfer than he was a thief, <laughs> so they they picked him up like the next day. And and uh, you know a couple years later, you know the endless summer was happening, and and he wanted to go, and they wanted him to go, and the only guy that would loan him money to make the trip was Hobie. Wow. I mean, he wow. just you know he had that kind of forgiveness wow. and that kind of you know faith in. in human nature. Jeff, you've got a book in front of you here, Hobie, Master of Water, Wind and Waves. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, I just, um, I mean, it's, we're lucky enough that this book actually got completed before my dad passed away. Um, it was something we wanted to do for a long time. And uh, uh, my wife, Lori, and I have been, you know, we, we always talk about, we got to get the, all this stuff down on paper. And my sister got involved and we tried to write it for a while. And um, we we didn't want to just go out and sell it. We wanted the story to be accurate. Um, sure. It wasn't about selling books. It was about, you know, just getting it, it down. And it's a big, long story with a lot of different people have different perspectives. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, Paul Holmes got involved with us and, and helped us write it and, and did a great job. Um, it's really, it's be, kind of become our Hobie Bible. We we now look up dates and things like that <laughs> to figure out what's going on. And yeah. there's great pictures. And uh, it... Um, it's just nice because it really does tell the story pretty complete. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a good, good long story of... Uh, it's available for people who may want to purchase? It's available at the Hobie stores. Um, I, it, it, yeah, it's available for purchase. It's been out now for about six, no, longer than that probably, eight months or something. It, 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 the nice thing is my dad got to read it. He, got a, he, was, he also was very technically involved with making sure every fact was correct. He, he didn't want to step on anyone's toes and claim something that wasn't his and... and uh, it made it a little more difficult for Paul to, to pull it all together, but it worked, and it's good. So glad this book got written because, you know, the last person that really kind of wanted to see it written for the longest time was Hobie. Hmm. And it was because he never, you know, once again, he never wanted to blow his own horn. And uh, I'm so glad it was written, and I thought I'd heard all the stories. You know, I'd hung around with the Metzes, and I'd hung around with the Hoffmans, and I'd hung around with all these different guys. But there were, in reading the book, I read it literally cover to cover. Uh, when it when it first came out, I couldn't I couldn't stop reading it, and the thing that I liked about it was, in every chapter there's some guy, and you know in one particular chapter I'll think it, Grubby Clark, Gordon Clark, Grubby Clark, and they were saying you know that you guys did this great thing. He's like yeah 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 no it, it was Hobie, it was it was a it was a chance for the guys that were there, uh, guys who are iconic to say yeah we did a lot of neat things but. But it was it was that guy. Yeah. It was Hobie that really uh, wow. knocked it out of the park and really kind of uh, accelerated the whole genre. Uh,